Hello, so we are back again today uh, with a section on attention, a brief review of what we have done up till now in attention. So, in the previous classes, uh, we looked at what is attention and the various factors which uh, go ahead and define how attention really works out to. So, specifically we uh, uh, looked at this brain process or uh, this mental process called attention, how it uh, goes ahead and distributes uh, the uh, cognitive uh, energy resources which is available and how attention is equivalent to mental concentration. Uh, we also looked at a method of uh, going ahead and performing attentional studies and in that we saw a brilliant experiment by Cherry which is called the dichotic listening task. Uh, the reason why this experiment was designed was because attentional studies are difficult to uh, carry out. And so, uh, after defining what Sherry uh, looked into or what Sherry's experiment brought out, it uh, the common result from the study was that uh, those stimuli which uh, we uh, focused our attention to, mental concentration to those got processed, but those stimuli to which we were not uh, uh, putting any men mental concentration from the unintended ear, they were not processed. But amazingly the study did uh, bring out this fact that some physical features of messages from the unintended ear was also processed. Now, Moray uh, came up and uh, gave a, a, a counter example or uh, basically a, a problem with the Sherry study. Uh, which was the cocktail party effect and through his cocktail party effect phenomena, he showed that at attention uh, even if you are not paying attention to uh, some stimuli, they pass the threshold. So, they are uh, registered onto our attentional system. So, working on this assumption that uh, even if we are not paying attention to some stimuli, they uh, are processed, several theories were developed and so, the first theory was the filter theory, which explained attention as a filter and the filter works on physical properties of the uh, incoming stimuli from perception. And so, they find that only those events to which we perceive our attention gets passed out and all other uh, stimuli to which we would not focus our attention gets excluded at the attentional filter. Uh, uh, Anna Trisman added a new theory into this whole idea of attention and uh, she uh, def, uh, defined or uh, showed that those stimuli uh, which, which were not processed or which were at the unattended ear were actually, uh, it is not that they were not processed, the volume were toned down, they were attenuated. And through a clever experiment, she showed that uh, people's attention uh, actually uh, worked as uh, all or none kind of a phenomena uh, and her task was the ear switching task. So, uh, basically Anna Trisman showed that uh, it is not that they do uh, the unattended ear, the information from the unattended ear does not get processed, they are toned down. And so, if need be or if the threshold of the incoming message is such that it is, uh, it is low, they do get processed. And so, an additional theory, a new theory was also proposed which is called the late selection theory, which argued against the filter theory saying that the bottleneck or the filter that we talk about in terms of processing of incoming messages does not exist at uh, the very beginning of a message, but at the late part of a message, which basically means that most messages are uh, processed till the meaning level, till, till a basic meaning level. In addition to this, uh, we had the multimodal theory and another theory, uh, which talks about the stages of processing of uh, any stimuli through the attentional filter. And so, uh, the modal theory defines that there are three stage of processing or there are three attentional filters, uh, which exist. And depending on uh, at which stage two messages uh, appear different to, uh, to the cognitive system. Uh, that is the point at which the filter is applied. So, at the first level uh, what happens is two messages are, uh, are 
uh, differentiated on in terms of the phonology uh, in I am sorry uh, not the phonology, but in, in terms of the basic physical properties like how, how what is the tone of it, how intense it is and so on and so forth. At the second level it is uh, the semantics or uh, the phonology and semantics of the message uh, which basically goes ahead and uh, designs the filter or is uh, responsible for filtration. And then there is a third stage if the messages are same in terms of uh, a basic meaning and, and uh, the basic physical properties a third level or a higher dimensional level is, is chosen for distinguishing two messages and this dimension uses both the physical properties phonological properties and the semantic properties of the message. So, all three are considered and differentiations of messages are done. So, uh, this is about the attentional theory. Now, in addition to this we also looked at something called automation. The question was whether if we do enough of practice can we go ahead and make a task automatic which basically means that it requires lesser and lesser attention and so more attention is available or more resources are available for putting ourselves to or doing some other work. And we define certain limits to it, uh, we define certain uh, features of how uh, preferences of attention really work and what is uh, uh, the basic uh, factors which uh, govern this automaticity that we are talking about. And in one of the interesting examples that we took in, in the last class which explained in the last class was the Stroop test. So, we saw that if enough practice is done, if enough, if enough practice is applied attention can be made automatic. And so, just uh, uh, the slide that you are seeing right now, it, it is the last slide from the last class which shows that with enough practice automation happens. So, in uh, today's class what we are going to see is the automation. Uh, how does this automation really work? This automation of attention really works and how, how is it helpful? I will also look at what is the difference between an automatic system and automatic processing of message and a controlled process, uh, processing of message. So, attentional systems how are attentional systems two systems which uh, use an automatic processing and a control processing how are they different and what are the factors governing them. In addition to uh, it we will also look at uh, some of the uh, examples or some of the good uh, uh, outgrowths of this attentional study. One outgrowth that we will look into is something called the psychological refractive period. So, let us continue with a discussion of automaticity of attention. So, a basic question which is in front of us right now is what does it mean to perform a task automatically? Automization of task performance, what is the meaning of that particular thing? And an answer was given by Snyder and Posner in 1975 and what they said was attentional processing is automatic or there is an automation of attentional process only when it fulfills any process fulfills three different things or three different features. The first is that the task that is at hand the task which is getting processed must occur without an intention which means that a task is said to be getting processed automatically with uh, automatic attentional systems with the help of automatic attentional systems it requires no intention at all. So, as soon as we develop an intention as soon as uh, we uh, think of a task and we develop an intention to do that particular task then uh, this particular task uh, uh, does not become automatic. So, it, uh, automatic task processing requires no intention and I will uh, give you an example to see how this automation really works. So, many a times in your everyday uh, uh, routine you would have seen that uh, the path from your university or the path from the place of your work to your home is somewhat automatically remembered to you. And so, at time what happens is when some other job for some other task is getting into your head for example, uh, some other uh, work related or university related problem is bugging you in some way. If that that is what is uh, happening then what would happen is 
uh, in those times you you will automatically uh, drive towards or automatically move towards your home and uh, this movement since since uh, the path between your home and your work is so well learned that if another task is taking up your attention you don't even realize that you had to go to the market, but then what has happened is since the your attentional capacity your mental resources were exerted were, uh, were engaged somewhere else, you automatically turn towards your home. So, which basically means that turning towards the act of turning towards your home is without intention and that is why it is an automatic process, because you did not decide to uh, go towards your home, you were deciding to go somewhere else, but since the mental effort the attentional processes were not available and so, since this task is so practiced this way from your home to the university or university or home is so well practiced. So, that uh, that unintentionally that without an intention you move towards your path, because this is what you do every day. Now, the second process uh, or the second feature that should be uh, uh, involved in an automatic processing or automatic processing of task is something called conscious without the task should happen without conscious awareness. So, if you make in mind or if you keep in mind the fact that I have to do a particular task and you do it with that form an intention consciously which means that you remind yourself so, somehow that I will do this task. Then doing that task will require attention and will not be automatic. For example, in, our, uh, in the one plot that I just gave to you, where uh, you move from the, uh, since your attention is so occupied, you move from your university to the home and you uh, in, in that path you automatically go towards your home. In that particular example, uh, the act of moving or taking the turn which, uh, which separates the, the way to the market to the way from the way to the home, the act of turning towards your home is without conscious awareness. So, you have not decided it, you have not formed an intention and it is without conscious awareness, you never uh, planned it before and so it is automatic in nature. And the third thing is that these tasks should not be uh, uh, or should not have any kind of interference from other mental activity. The meaning of this is that if another mental activity which is similar to the automatic task with the, to the task which has requires automatic processing or which goes to automatic processing, if they are same what would happen is the task will no more be automatic. So, in our example since a work problem or university problem has engaged you in certain way and it has nothing to do with motor movement, it has nothing to do with thinking about going home or anything related uh, to you going to home. Uh, this other task which you are thinking uh, takes up a lot of your mental activity, a lot of your mental resources and this mental activity is very different from the walking task or riding uh, or whatever way you communicate from your university to home. And so, since the two tasks are very different in nature, the second task of inevitantly of uh, unintentionally moving towards your home or taking the turn towards your home becomes automatic in nature. So, basically summing it up any automatic task should have three features into it, it should be done it should not be done with, with an intention, it should not have a conscious awareness behind it, so which basically means that you should not be consciously doing it. And the third is that this task should not be interfered with any mental activity. So, the mental activity interfere with it, it the task will not be becoming automatic or the task would not become automatic. So, next let us take a look at uh, what, what does it mean uh, to have a control process task and an automatic process task. What I mean by here is that those tasks which require uh, a, a control processing, attentional processing and those tasks which require un unintentional processing or unintentional processing which are automatic in nature, what is the difference between tasks like this. Now, so uh, one of the interesting things is uh, before discussing this is something called attentional capture, we will come to that in a moment. So, look at uh, the display in front of you. Now, in this display if I asked you to find out the one item which does not belong to the display, your answer is very quick that 3 is the word or 3 is the letter which pops out or which is not equivalent to what the display is. And so, this is called the pop up phenomena and this becomes this is an automatic phenomena. So, those, but if I ask you to find out 
the uh, uh, specific letter for example, say the letter i or letter c it will take more time. So, 3 throws out itself to you and so it becomes automatic and whereas, searching for i or c in this display is a more controlled task because it will require you to uh, go ahead and, and uh, basically do control processing, attentional processing for finding this letter. So, distinguishing this uh, how this control and automatic processing uh, works and uh, what are the factors which control it. Sni uh, Snyder and Schifrin in 1977 designed a very ingenious experiment to test whether uh, or what are the factors which control or which uh, go ahead and define an attentional and a non-intentional processing. So, basically it is a search letter, it is a, it is a search task and the search uh, is either of a letter or of a digit in a frame. So, it is a very simple task a certain target is given and you have to search this target in a particular frame. Now, there are two different versions of uh, this particular task one is called one version is called the varied mapping version and the other is called the consistent mapping version of this task. So, what is the task like? The task has a certain target. So, these in the varied mapping uh, version of it you would have targets as both letters or uh, a digit or a letter as a target. So, you can have L 1 3 P as a target whereas, in the consistent version of the task you either have letters or you have digits. So, you can either you have 1, 2, 4, 6 as a target because this is what you need to search in the frame. So, this is called uh, the, the memory set, this is what subjects have to commit to memory and then there is a frame that you have to search these targets from. So, one difference between varied and, and consistent mapping is that in varied mapping you could have both numbers and letters as in the memory set the set for to which you need to compare whereas, in the consistent mapping either have numbers or you have letters. Then you have a display like this which is called uh, the frame and what you need to do is you need to search this in the frame. So, in the varied condition you would have either letters or numbers onto the frame of search. So, so, what you need to do is to find out whether this is present in this frame or not. So, it could the memory set could be one letter, it could be two letter, could be three letter <laughs> depending on uh, different versions of the task it could be anything and the task is to search whether this memory set is present in this frame or not. The differences uh, I also go along telling you the differences between two versions of the task in the varied version you have either letters or digits that need to be searched whereas, in the consistent for, uh, version you all only have either letters or digits. Similarly, in the frame set also there is a difference. The difference here is that in the case of varied uh, mapping version the search in the frame set what you are searching in the frame the frame could also have both letters and digits whereas, in the consistent ver version if I am searching for numbers or if I am searching for digits you only have digits which are reported here. Another interesting thing or another change uh, which distinguishes these two versions of the task is that in this version in the varied version one of these letters one of these uh, item in the memory set could become a distractor into the next frame. For example, I have p here in the memory set this p can very well appear in a different memory set. Uh, and, uh, so, what would happen is since p is available here now it is a target in this case the, this p because the next search item is q 3 uh, 2 8 and so in this case uh, 
q is the letter here and p which has been used previously in this memory set which was an item of the memory now be a noise present here which uh, serves as a distractor whereas this is not true for the varied and the uh, consistent mapping of it. So, three differences first of all what happens is that memory set there is a difference in terms of memory set memory set in the varied version uh, could be both letters and numbers whereas, in the consistent version it is either letters and numbers. Second the frame set could have both letters and numbers in the varied condition whereas, in the consistent condition it will either be letters or it will either be numbers both is not true and third that one item or any item from the memory set can become a distractor in the next frame in the next trial of the task whereas, each trial is new or each uh, uh, new uh, e each new presentation of frame is actually new it has nothing from the older memory set. So, an experiment was uh, done like this and people were supposed to find out this or basically go ahead and tell whether this particular memory set is present in this frame or not. Varying this three other factors were varied in addition to whatever we have discussed here. So, one uh, uh, factor which were varied was called the frame size, size of the frame. So, basically how many letters do appear here. So, frame size is equivalent to how many letters or how many digits are appearing in the frame. The second thing that was there is for how long, so frame size and then frame time how long these frames were presented. So, you see a target and the frame is shown to you and so, uh, the length of time uh, for which the frame was presented to you. So, it was a fast frame presentation or a slow frame presentation. And the third thing was the memory set itself. So, how many letters were present in the memory set that you need to search? It could be 1, it could be 2, it could be 4. So, depending on 4 was the highest number which was there. So, I have displayed the highest number. It could also be just one letter 1 that you need to search. So, these three factors were actually uh, used and this kind of a search task was designed. The results were very interesting. So, there is a good amount of work or uh, there is a good amount of results which are uh, came out of the study and it proposed some of the very good uh, um, uh, outputs in cognitive psychology and I will refer you, I will uh, basically uh, uh, suggest you to read this uh, Snyder and uh, Schrifrin experiment. So, S C H N I D E R and S H I F F R I N 1977 this experiment was done. So, let us focus on to some of the most uh, uh, consistent results since we, the study in through this study we are trying to see how does consistent mapping or does control uh, sorry how does control processing and at an automatic processing work. So, let us look at the, uh, uh, the results which are akin to these two problems. So, what are the results then and so the results that we got uh, or the results that these psychologists got was in the varied condition all three factors right the frame time the frame size and the memory set had a role to play into how fast you are actually processing. Now, if you look into it, it is actually the consistent mapping is representing something called automatic processing and varied mapping requires something called control processing, because what could happen is that the memory set could, uh, memory set could have numbers and uh, letters both and similarly, the frame could have numbers and letters. So, you need more attentional system to process and so, the results suggested that the varied mapping condition all three factors actually went ahead and showed their effects onto results. Whereas, in the consistent mapping condition only you have guessed correct it is the frame time, how much time the frame was present. Because one of the things is that is encoding. So, if a stimulus is not encoded at all control processing cannot take place. So, since it is letters verifying letters and numbers verifying numbers the only factor the only uh, variable which went ahead and, and uh, 
uh, and affected or um, this consistent mapping paradigm was the frame time, whereas in consistent in, in the result for very um, varied mapping condition you have the frame size, the frame time as well as the memory set of how many letters are being searched all three of them made their uh, marks into it or made their uh, uh, effects or showed their effects onto this search process. So, the thing is attentional is a cognitive capacity and just before attention to start or part of attention also works in terms of uh, perception. So, uh, we have seen our section on perception and it is a good time to ask the question what role does attention play in perception and this is the exact question which uh, um, uh, was asked by Anna Tresman. She asked the role of attention and automaticity of attention of controlled and automatic attention that plays in perception. And so, what very briefly what the theory says is that attention has a lot of role to play in perception. And what is it? Anna Tresman investigated through the feature integration model and what we find out is that any perception to take place has two stages. So, perception is basically a two stage process. It starts, so this is a bottom up process, it starts this way. In stage 1 what happens is it is called the pre attentive stage and in stage 1 what really happens is that the physical features of a stimulus that is incoming uh, in into perceptual into perceptual uh, system into the uh, perceptual uh, uh, module for processing uh, those basic features are integrated together. And so, we register features of object color and shape into the pre attentive stage. So, perception is a two part process because attention plays a role into it. In the first part of perception, the basic features of any stimulus are recorded are mapped or integrated and then there is a attentive stage a second stage. So, first stage basic features are integrated together or a whole is combined through various uh, features of the uh, of the um, uh, incoming stimuli. Here attention allows to glue the features together. So, basically this is as you can see there is a curvature, depth, motion, orientation, color these are the physical features and so these features this is the pre attentive stage in which these features are actually integrated together under the attentional spotlight. We will discuss the attentional spot, uh, spotlight paradigm and only this attentional spotlight only after this is integrated together here does the attentive stage works through which a meaning is generated. So, object perception and object recognition is takes place at the attentive stage. So, think of it in this way as you as we see something as soon as we see something initially in the first stage things like color, shape, texture, gradient this kind of things are available to us, but if we uh, if that particular image or if whatever we are seeing is available for more time they are glued together to make a meaning, which basically suggests that if something is presented to very fast people will be able to tell the physical features, but may not be able to tell what does the uh, thing mean or what is the object in terms of object recognition. And this particular feature where if a stimulus is presented very fast, so that the attentional stage, so that the attentive stage is uh, somehow hindered people report something called illusory correlation. So, if, if a stimulus if two features of a stimulus is presented very fast what really happens is the, uh, the pre attentive stage automatic stage recognizes uh, the features of the stimulus and so later, but the gluing is not correct you do not know what is what. Think of it in this way if I quickly show you four different cars in four different colors in four different model and I show you for one thousandth of a second kind of a one hundredth of a second uh, kind of a, um, a display and very quickly I uh, so, uh, I show you this and very quickly I take it away and then ask you what do you actually see in terms of uh, tell me the colors of the car, tell me the models of the car and also tell me which car was which model. Amazingly you will find out that you could 
tell me the color of the car, you could also tell me how the model look like because the model is basically the model of a car is displayed by the logo of the car. So, you can perceive the features of the logo or the, uh, the image of the logo and so you can tell me what car was present. So, you could go ahead and tell me that a blue car was present and a, and a car uh, which is Honda was present because Honda has a logo a specific kind of a logo or Maruti was present. But if it is very fast what would happen is you will mix up everything and so you tend to tell me that a blue Maruti was present where whereas the truth is that of course a blue car was present of course a Maruti was present but what happened is they were not the same and this is what is called illusory correlation. So, Tresman and Schmidt, 1982 interesting study showed that when attention is diverted or overloaded participant makes something called illusory correlation. So, if I give you more than one job to do is uh, in, the, in our previous example as I defined, if I give you two job for example, if I ask you very simple questions of what was the car color or what was the car model it is an easy answer, but when I mix them together which model which car and which color then the problem becomes more and since it was presented for very very brief period of time these illusory correlations uh, do happen. So, in terms of uh, in uh, terms of an attresement, this kind of display was used. Now, in the first display, it is very easy because people were asked to, to report an S, right? just a letter S or, uh, uh, or a particular uh, color of uh, or double X or S or a T. So, uh, tell me those letters which appear in the uh, pink color or tell me uh, those letters which uh, are different than the display. So, most of the uh, most of the display has X's and T's and S is the only one which is different and so this kind of questions can be very easily answered and this requires automatic nearly automatic processing or no attention at all because this pops up and this is what is called attentional capture. What happens is that this particular thing pops up it moves out. Now, I have seen these websites several websites which are there when you visit a website what really happens is that certain things keep moving at the bottom or certain things quickly change color and they catch your attention, but other things do not. So, basically it is a phenomena like this what happens is that this with the very idea that it is different in terms of shape and shape is a very basic feature at the pre attentive stage itself this get captures, but look at display number 2. Now, in display number 2 if I ask you to find an x which is green in color. So, I will ask you to find a letter which is of different color. So, a letter and a color. So, now two features to be looked at a different color has to be looked at and a different uh, letter has to be looked at and if the display is presented very fast you can of course, see two colors and a different color is there and a different name is there. So, which is the digit which is in a different color two features required when two features required this becomes more of a controlled processing. So, when more than one because here what would happen is if an illusory correlation can happen. I will tell you how it, the, the, how it happens. What happens is if this display is presented very fast, then you tend to say yes a T with a green color was there right or if it is very very fast you would see a V because it looks more or less like this, but then what really happens is that if two features are, are asked a letter with a different color and a different image is what you need to find out if that is what you need to do then a problem exists because there are two features that you are looking in, into and so the two piece features has to be somehow combined single feature presentation or sig single feature identification happens in the pre attentive stage whereas this multiple feature com comparison and object recognition require the attentive phase. And so, at the attentive phase, so this, this particular uh, task requires the control processing or attentive phase to really work and this requires the automatic phase. So, uh, the answer to the question of how perception or attention affects perception is that if tasks are automatic in nature or tasks require a very physical features basic physical features for identification they are or nearly automatic, but if tasks have more stimulus tasks have more features and they require uh, some more uh, processing then attention comes into play and so attentional systems are needed. So, very simple tasks do not require attention or they are more or less automatic in nature. A related feature is something called attentional capture, the thing we were discussing uh, in the 
in 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 the studies uh, before. So, visual search task they if uh, they use this or they have this pop up phenomena. Remember the example that I gave you in websites there are certain features there are certain uh, animations out there which quickly change color and form and so they capture your attention and this is called the pop up phenomena or pop out phenomena. And so, experimental psychologists call this phenomena as attentional capture which means that they mean to imply a stimuli that cause an involuntary shift in attention. So, these features are such that they uh, somehow throw themselves out of the stimulus set which is in, in a work and they uh, desire your attention or they uh, move to, uh, out of, uh, of, of the display capturing your attention. Psychologists have defined attentional capture to be a bottom up process driven on entirely or almost by properties of the stimulus rather than perceiver goal. So, it is basically it, it is a stimulus feature which makes something pop out, but it, is, it has nothing to do with whether the observer has anything to do with it, whether the person perceiving has anything to do with it. So, if you look into here, uh, if I give you a second to look into here and tell me what is the problem. Uh, so, most of you would point out that this is not possible from 1842 to 2007 is something which is wrong and this captures attention most people's attention it should be 1942 and this is an error. So, basically this system which pops out which says that uh, which somehow tells you that this long somebody cannot leave that is what, what is called attentional uh, capture. So, an interesting experiment was done with attentional capture. So, what was this experiment? Basically, this experiment had this kind of circles, 6 or 7 circles and at the center of these circles you had the number 8 written onto them and all these circles were grey in colour. So, this kind of circle was there and people were asked to look into this circle and so, at certain predefined time all but one circle. Remember all of these are grey colored circles with the letter 8 into it. So, at a predefined time let us say after 1 second or after 5 second all but one circle they change their color. So, most of the circles change their color from grey to red and so the inside became C right. So, one circle let us say this circle remained grey and this circle all these circles became red and so the in and also the inside of the circles changed from A to C. Now, the question was asked that first of all tell me which of the circles did not change the color uh, uh, that thing and what is written inside that circle. Now, unknown to the observer an extra red circle appeared either here or somewhere in the display. So, an extra circle came up into this display and uh, popped up from some uh, from somewhere and the task is uh, taxing because people have to uh, find out how many circles change color, which was which, which was the one which did not change color and which what is the shift in terms of letters. And so, when a display like this was used and a sudden letter a sudden new circle with uh, red circle appears uh, somewhere in this display with uh, with C written on it or with something written on it, you would uh, uh, what is the result you would assume. Most people almost 85 percent people actually saw the red cir uh, circle appearing. What happened is that irrespective of the fact that people had their attentional uh, blocked up by the task itself, but this circle suddenly appearing uh, somewhere other than this this particular slot it captured their attention. So, red circle in the middle or somewhere here there it captured the attention and this is what is called attentional capture. Think of it in terms of those websites those things which capture your attention things which uh, come out or it, it come out because they have that the stimulus the those things or those events has certain features they jump out of the, the or the screen or jump out of uh, any environment onto you and with the fact that you have nothing to do with it you were not expecting it. So, kind of an unexpected event and so this is uh, what uh, this particular uh, theory of attentional capture basically goes ahead and uh, tells us.
Now, so based on what we have learned uh, up till now, Gordon Logan and Joseph Etherton, uh, they combined this idea of what attention is, when it becomes automatic, when it becomes controlled, what are the factors, combine all these two, th things together to give an att att attentional hypothesis of attention. Now, what is this hypothesis? This hypothesis is very simple in nature. What it says is that attention is only required at the practice phase of any task. And so, as soon as you have started practicing, as soon as you have uh, enough practice, the task becomes automatic. But if something changes, in, in the stimuli in which it is being presented, again a practice is required or the fact that. So, basically attentional hypothesis of automation states that attention is needed just during the practice phase of a task and determines what gets learned during practice. So, and uh, attention also determines what will be remembered from practice. So, simply says it says that basically learning is a byproduct of attention, but if something else changes into the stimuli, then what happens is you do not learn it and so you need uh, attention stage to further follow. So, just at the time of learning a task you need attention and once you have learned it enough, the task somehow becomes automated. It is basically uh, what uh, experience would suggest. So, if you are a tennis player at the initial hours, you need all kind of attention to learn what is the backhand, what is the forehand, what is the serve and so on and so forth and how to do the footwork and these kind of things. But once you know this task very well, playing tennis is almost automatic in nature until and unless something changes. And they did a very good experiment to prove that it is uh, practice that require this kind of attention. So, they use something called pad associate learning to prove that this kind of automation hypothesis uh, appears, which means that practice requires automization and after practice. Uh, practice requires attention sorry and after that the task becomes automatic. So, they use this kind of a pad associate task in their task what they had, they had this kind of pair. So, you had the word steel which is attached to a word uh, let us say Canada right and this kind of pairs were presented to people. And so, people had to learn this kind of a task. So, uh, this kind of pair associate has to be learned. And in uh, one version of the task, this steel was never paired to any other word. And so, they were very specific in terms of this. In another version of the task, the word steel was sometimes paired to Canada, whereas sometimes it was paired to let us say broccoli another word which is there. Now, in this case you see that performance is increased and tasks become automatic or the processing becomes automatic. Since, steel on Canada are related only one. So, if I do a retrieval of this task, it is more or less automatic, but in this case where steel sometimes appear with Canada, the task is paired associated. So, most paired associate tasks require you to learn both the pairs and at retrieval you are given the Q, this is the Q. So, in this case steel is called the Q and you when I say the Q steel, you, the person who is responding, the person who is retrieving back has to tell me the target. So, Canada here is called the target and so person has to, the person who is responding back has to tell Canada. So, this is the kind of job. So, when steel is specifically related to Canada, the performance becomes uh, rather automatic and so what happens is that only during the practice of it, you need to put more focus and so task learning is very fast. But in terms when it is in the second case, when steel is related to Canada somehow and, and in another terms, in another version of it steel is also related to broccoli. When I say steel, the performance does not become automatic and so you have to actually think, use your brain and use more attention to come up with the particular answer to uh, uh, the question. Also, it was shown that even if one part of this pad associate learning. If the Q was colored in some way, if the Q was green in color and this was white in color, even in those cases this learning was very slow and it was not automatic, it required a lot of attention which means that failures were uh, huge, it took more time to responding. So, this is more faster, this is more slower and even changing one part of this, the Q part of it required uh, people more time. 
So, basically this task somehow this experiment uh, goes ahead and proves that only during practice you need attention whereas, once the practice is over it is automation or, or uh, the automatic processing starts happening you do not need attention that much, but only in those cases where nothing is changed from the original display. If something is changed in the original display is some form of change is made then attention will again be plotted back or required back. An interesting thing or an interesting feature of this attention or this task of attention is something called the psychological refractive period. So, you would have seen that the premise of this whole thing is that with attention with more practice this attention becomes more or less automatic things become automatic. So, the question is are there tasks where no matter how much practice you do it does not become automatic are there tasks which are there and so to prove that uh, principle something called psychological refractive period was defined. So, psychological refractive period the existence of this period basically says that there are certain kind of task or there are certain kind of scenarios where no matter how much practice you do with a particular task what really happens is that you tend to have uh, no automaticity or very less automaticity into it. So, uh, how does the thing really work? So, psychological refractive period refers to the delay observed in execution of a uh, of the second of the two tasks which must be in close temporal succession with this task. So, basically I will define the experiment and then uh, let you know what this particular thing is. So, two tasks were actually given let us first look at the uh, pattern of how it happens. So, there is a first task the if two tasks are there and so, uh, what we are trying to see is what is the reason why two tasks are given and enough practice is given into both the tasks. If both the tasks are well learned still we do not see them being automatic what, why this happens. So, we are seeing that. So, let us say this is the first task uh, now there are three stars three stages to a task one is the perceptual analysis one is the response selection then is the response processing. So, if a job is given to a task is given to the first thing is you have to look at what the task is the encoding phase then select a response to particular that task and then uh, go ahead and uh, respond to it. Now, if a second task is given to you in quick succession right in this SOA means stimulus onset anchorony. How close this is a time dimension. So, del t how much close these stimuluses are I will explain to you in the in the next figure. And so, in a second so while the first task is being proceeded a second task starts. Now, this particular slack which is there which says that the delayed response selection if a second task comes in when the first task is being processed this is called the psychological refractive period. What does it really mean? It means that if two tasks are presented to you and even if they are very well learned task, but as the first task is being processed a second task is also introduced what will really happen that the second task will get delayed in terms of processing and this delay that you see is what is called the psychological refractive period. Now, in the original experiment of this PRP what happened is a stimulus was presented as first stimulus was presented to people and this stimulus was a stimulus, simple stimulus people had to hear a tone. So, we had two tones we had a high tone and we had a low tone and people had to hear this tone and basically uh, so this is the hearing part. So, you hear this tone and then categorize it whether it is a high tone or low tone. This is stimulus number 1. A second stimulus was given which was delayed a little bit. So, once this stimulus was given once the tone task started a little bit a del t time after that a second task was given to you a second task was uh, in terms of a uh, 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 letter identification. So, an image was presented to uh, in front of you and what you had to do is look at this image. So, if an image of A was presented to you what you had to do is look at this A. So, basically this is the display you see an A and when you see uh, a letter uh, a vowel or a consonant you have to press a different button. So, a button pad is given to you you have to press the left button 
if it is a vowel and the right button if it is a consonant. So, two tasks are there, one task is the tone matching task. So, you have to tell whether it is uh, high or low and when and the other is the letter identification task when you see a letter you have to press a particular button. Now, what is the uh, experimental paradigm say? So, the experimental paradigm says that if enough time if delta t right the time between S 1 and S 2 is high then performance of the second task does not require uh, or happens flawlessly second task proceeds as usual. But as you start narrowing this delta t if you start bringing this delta t this t or rather uh, instead of delta t I would say t here. So, t is the time difference between S 1 and S 2, but as soon as you start narrowing this t as soon as you start presenting this S 1 and S 2 in quick successions if the time difference between presentation of this task S 1 and S 2 is high what would happen is that response delay would happen which means that response for the second task will get delayed more and more and which basically means that the response to the first task only after the response to the first task a certain delay will come in before the response to the second task come in. So, quickly understand the paradigm of this two tasks are given to you task 1 tone matching task 2 is uh, identifying images and so what happens is as the difference between these two tasks are more if uh, task 1 completes and the second task starts after that no delay is there or even in between if it starts no delay is there and so no psychological refractive period. Uh, but if the first task and second task happen near to simultaneous. If first task is started and just within a delta t time or a very less time after the start of the first task, the second task is reduced, the response to the second task delays and this delay is called the psychological refractive period. So, this delta t or this response, this lack the time that it takes for response R 2 to happen is what is called the psychological refractive period. So, a general interpretation of the PRP effect assume the presence of a bottleneck when initiating a response to stimuli. Now, in very simple words if detected a stimulus and, uh, and are processing that information while a second stimulus comes along uh, we are unable to attend to the second stimulus and that is what is the psychological refractive period. Now, the question is why does PRP happen or where is this bottleneck this delay the bottleneck is the delay uh, of which uh, which is there in responding to the second task. So, where is this delay coming from where is this delay uh, uh, happening and so three answers have been given by Palsha 19 Paschler 1963 and was Paschler 1963 says that there are three interpretations of it. It could be at the stage of presentation of the second stimulus. What could happen is the bottleneck hap uh, happens because the second stage the presentation of the second stimulus is very quick and so this delay occurs because the presentation of the second stimulus is in quick succession or it could be the stage of which a response is selected for the first stimulus. So, basically or it could be at the stage of making a response. So, three scenarios can uh, exist where I have as I said this is my stimulus presentation, this is my response selection and this is my response for stimulus 1 whereas, for the second case this is my S 2, this is my response selection to S 2 and this is my response to S 2. So, response to S 1 and response to S 2 and there are three scenarios uh, the bottleneck can appear because of uh, because of the fact that this second stimulus appears because the presentation second stimulus or it could be because the response selection of this happens and so since the response selection has not happened a slack happens here or it could be because of the response giving out of the response or emitting the response creates this kind of a uh, bottleneck which is there and the most prominent example or most prominent answer which has been given by Pachler and on Welford's theory is that at the stage of response is selected. So, what happens here is that at the stage of selection of a response if a second stimulus comes in if a second stimulus comes in when the first response or the first stimulus is still being processed a response of it is being selected what will happen is you will observe psychological refractive period. But if the response has already been selected, but the response has not been given in those cases the psychological refractive period will not occur think of it in terms of a example you go to a bank teller who is working on a job so uh, so 
customer one comes in and asks a question. Now, as soon as the question is put into this person, this bank teller, he searches for an answer. Now, a second customer comes in and asks a question. Psychological refractive period will only occur if the second person, the second customer puts a question and this question interferes or comes in or is uh, uh, appears at the time when the uh, bank teller or when the bank person is still searching for an answer, is doing a response selection, still searching for an answer for the customer. In case the bank teller has already found the answer and it is only the response that he has to give, no kind of slack will happen and both responses will be automatic, you could answer to both the persons at the same point of time. But then in cases where the person, uh, the bank teller is still working at an answer and you put your question quickly, what really happens is that second stimulus get processed delayed, get processed at a later point of time and the delay that it takes from response selection for response selection of, of stimulus 1 to the, res, uh, to the response selection to the starting of response selection of item 2 is what is called the psychological refractive period. So, in very simple terms the time slack which happens or the time lag which happens for the processing of a second stimulus when S1 and I present S2 are presented very nearly in equal time that and that happening because the response selection for stage 1 or stimulus 1 is still happening and, st and S2 ab arrives at a time when S1's response selection is still being taking place is what is called psychological refractive period or psychological refractive period in very very simple terms is a delay on response to stimulus 2 because stimulus 1 is still getting processed. But if the processing has happened, if the answer has is present then psychological refractive period will not occur. So, in this section, in this particular uh, the, uh, 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 class, we looked at what is automization, what are the factors for automization, how to test automization, what is controlled processing and autom uh, an automatic processing in attention and we also looked at what is called uh, how attention is uh, a part of, of perception, how attention plays a part into perception. We looked at attentional capture and also something called psychological refractive period which means that even if two jobs, even if two tasks are very automatic, if it is well learned task, still the idea that one task comes in quick succession or it comes quickly after the other task and the response selection or, or the kind of answer to the first task has not been selected from, from the memory, then it creates. So, basically psychological refractive period is a memory uh, related phenomena and so that creates a time delay in response of the second stimulus and that is what is called the psychological refractive period. So, this, this is an end to the section on attention, we will meet again with a new section on memory. Thank you.